A little over a thousand years ago, a volcanic eruption occurred at such a tremendous scale that it was one of the most powerful and violent eruptions to have occurred on our planet in the past 5,000 years. The volcano that created this eruption is a baffling entity, as it lies in a very strange geographical location that is far away from any active subduction zones. This volcano has puzzled scientists for decades. How and why does this volcano exist? And why is it so unbelievably explosive and powerful? Was it fueled by a volcanic hotspot similar to volcanoes that are found in places such as Hawaii or Yellowstone? Or was something else causing this? As it turns out, something very unique is happening here. Today, we're going to take a look at the volcano known as Pake 2 Mountain. Pake 2 Mountain is a stratovolcano that lies on the border of China and North Korea, and it's a significant feature for both cultures. It lies in an area known as the Pake 2 Mountain Range, which is located within the Gamer Plateau. The Gamer Plateau is an ancient shield volcano spawned by tracky basalt lava, and it was formed by the same volcanic magma chamber that is present-day Pake 2 Mountain. It was formed between 2 to 5 million years ago, and it covers over 15,000 square kilometers worth of land. Recently, the existence of this volcano has finally been solved, and has single-handedly changed how most geologists think of volcanoes and the fueling of them. At 2,744 meters high, Pake 2 Mountain is considered to be a supervolcano, and its caldera lake borders present-day China and North Korea. Its caldera lake was unsurprisingly created during the aforementioned eruption, which was so powerful it altered the climate of the globe. It erupted at a magnitude 7, spewing around 120 cubic kilometers worth of tephra, or more, during the eruption, with some scientists estimating it was actually larger at 160 cubic kilometers. Regardless of the number, this eruption created an unbelievably devastating situation to the surrounding land and to areas far from the epicenter. When this volcano erupted, the original shape that it had and structure was completely obliterated during the eruption and was literally blasted to bits. All that was left was a stub where a conical mountain once lay, and in time the 5 km wide caldera that was created during the eruption was filled with water and turned into a 384 meter deep lake known as Tianchi Lake or Heaven Lake. To put things into scale, Anak Krakatoa's most recent eruption was only a magnitude 3 on the volcanic explosivity index. In 1883, Krakatoa erupted at a scale that was so destructive it blasted the island into three separate parts, and that was a magnitude 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Compared to Pake 2, it released only 10 cubic kilometers worth of volcanic ejecta, whereas Pake 2 released over 120 cubic kilometers. When this volcano first started its life, it erupted in a very gentle, effusive manner, building up the massive Gamer Plateau that was mentioned earlier. These eruptions would have led to the trapping of any subsequent magma that was ascending from deep within the earth, and as a result of this, the magma chamber became capped, and it would begin to build up pressure to very violent levels. Alongside this, the chemistry of the magma itself began to be altered as the hot tracky basalt began to melt the nearby continental crust, leading to an increase of the level of silica, which would be the recipe needed for the cataclysmic eruptions that would occur in time from this volcano. This volcano has demonstrated a short eruption cycle compared to other supervolcanoes that normally explode after tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years and has been erupting at a very violent scale for many thousands of years, and has produced calderas in the past, with one major magnitude 7 eruption occurring at some time around 4,000 years ago. This previous eruption was known as the Tianwenfeng eruption, and if you'd like for me to make a video on this, please leave me a comment letting me know, and I'll see what I can dig up in the scientific literature about this eruption, which was as massive as the Millennium eruption. This previous eruption was also recorded and exists within Manchurian myths, with the mountain being described as a fire dragon, fire demon, or as a heavenly fire. 
And this event turned a surrounding forest into carbonized wood and spewed out 25 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, with a bulk volume of over 100 kilometers cubed released during the eruption. So at some point around 546 AD, the volcano was ready to release another devastating eruption. The Millennium Eruption This eruption would have began as an increase in earthquakes in the surrounding area as magma began to push its way out of the magma chamber and through the earth when it finally became pressurized to a point that the magma chamber could no longer sustain. When it finally reached the surface, it would have started as a very explosive blast. It's possible there are some other warnings that this major eruption was imminent, but when it finally occurred, the surrounding land would never be the same again. It would release several distinct pyroclastic flows, leaving behind both welded and unwelded ignimbrites in distinctly separate layers. The first phase of the most recent eruption was in the form of a typical Plinian volcanic eruption. Plinian eruptions are the typical explosive kind of eruption most people think of when they see large conical volcanic structures. Examples of volcanoes that are famous for erupting at a Plinian level are Krakatoa or Mount Vesuvius. They are extremely destructive and are massive in scale. They release volcanic bombs and devastating pyroclastic flows, but they are still gentler compared to what is known as the Ultra Plinian eruption, aka the supervolcanic eruption. Ultraplinian eruptions begin at a magnitude of 7 and go up to 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. So when Mount Paektu started its devastating planet-altering eruption sometime around 946 AD, it began as a Plinian phase, and it's thought that this phase lasted 3 to 9.5 days in length. At the very start of the eruption, white pumice and ash were released alongside a massive eruption column, the eruption would then continue in intensity and begin to release dangerous volcanic bombs alongside increased pumice falls and pyroclastic flows. It would continue to do this in the coming hours and days, slowly emptying its magma chamber out in the process, leading to the climactic event that would soon occur, the caldera collapse and the release of vast quantities of ignimbrite. At this point in time, it's believed Mount Peg 2 was a conical mountain, but that would soon change in an instant when, at some point, the ground became unstable and the magma chamber collapsed in upon itself, leading to the release of extremely large pyroclastic flows alongside the largest and most violent phase of the eruption to have occurred thus far. The volcano would have been erupting in a manner that was increasingly violent for some time, but what occurred during the caldera collapse would have been something truly terrifying to have heard or witnessed. There are some actual records of the eruption that were documented by the unlucky inhabitants that lived near the explosion when it actually happened. Thunders from the Heaven Drum were heard in the city of Kaesong, which in modern days is right near the border of North and South Korea, and then again in the capital of ancient Korea, about 450 kilometers south of the volcano, which terrified the ruling emperor so much that convicts were pardoned and set free. They are probably the only people in the history of mankind that were thankful a supervolcanic eruption had occurred. Another book mentions that on November 3rd of that same year, in the city of Nara, which is in Japan roughly 1,100 kilometers or 680 miles southeast of the mountain, an event of white ash rain was recorded. In its most recent eruption, it spawned a column that was over 36 kilometers in height and during the violent caldera collapse, pyroclastic flows were deposited in all directions, scorching the earth and burying alive anything within a 40 km radius of the caldera. It would bury it beneath large amounts of ignimbrite, with the average thickness being between 7.5 meters to upwards of 80 meters in some valleys. It launched debris as far as Greenland, 7,527 kilometers away, and spewed more than 45 million tons of sulfur. It smothered the surrounding landscape in numerous pyroclastic flows and unleashed 1,000 times more energy than the famous 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. The main pyroclastic flow that was generated during the caldera collapse was estimated to have been traveling around 170 meters per second, which is 610 kilometers per hour, 
And when this pyroclastic flow was up to 50 kilometers away from the caldera, the average speed was still 50 meters per second or 180 kilometers per hour. It's estimated that the climax of this eruption might have lasted from between one and a half to four days in total. The overall eruption time is estimated to have been between four and a half to 14 days in total. After the caldera collapsed, an unbelievable amount of volatiles and aerosols were released into the atmosphere, leading to the formation of a volcanic winter that would last for several years following the eruption. It's worth noting that we don't actually know the exact year that this eruption occurred at, we only know that it occurred sometime around 946 AD. The reason we call it the 946 eruption is purely because of the unusual cold period that occurred in 946 AD onwards, so scientists think the actual eruption year might have been in 945 AD, because it's thought that this eruption resulted in a worldwide climatic impact and is believed to have caused a substantial volcanic winter. Smaller eruptions since the major one have occurred in 1668, 1702 and 1903, reminding us that one day it's going to make its triumphant return. And in the last decade, Peitu has begun showing increased activity and its existence came to light to many people during the recent nuclear tests in North Korea which were detonated ridiculously close to Mount Peiktu, causing earthquakes and sending the Richter scale into a frenzy as it picked up measurements of a magnitude 5 to 7.6 earthquake, and this test sent powerful pressure waves towards Peiktu's massive magma chamber. This pressure is being transferred directly to the magma. Some of the more recent events that are occurring have come in the form of magma intrusions into the magma chamber, which have been episodic in their occurrence. What this means is that magma from deep within the earth has been successfully injected into the magma chamber, leading to increases in the pressurization and volume of the overall chamber. So let's answer the question that's baffled scientists for decades. How does this volcano exist? It's quite fascinating really. It's actually related to the nearby subduction of the Pacific plate underneath the Okosk and Philippine tectonic plates. But this is where things take an interesting turn. You see, the Pacific Plate hasn't done what most scientists expected it to do. It hasn't directly subducted in a way that would send it travelling deeper and deeper into the Earth in the direction of the mantle. Instead, this plate has become stuck and wedged and has buckled in an outward manner, leading to it becoming trapped and stagnant in a way that has pushed it in a near horizontal manner. The fueling of Mount Peiktu is created by the melting of a trapped Pacific plate that has pushed itself so far it is now underneath the Eurasian plate and the water that is being released by the hydrous minerals contained within the ocean crust of the Pacific plate is being released, which is lowering the melting point of the surrounding crust and is creating a buoyant upwelling of magma, leading to the creation of Mount Peiktu in present day. This volcanic structure has revolutionized how we see volcanoes and intraplate volcanic eruptions, because this means there is an additional way that volcanoes can exist. It seems like ancient subducted plates can also become trapped and can buckle in extremely strange angles, leading to it traveling in a horizontal angle and not in a vertical one. And on top of this, scientists have found many other ancient tectonic plates that have been swallowed up during past subduction events and they now exist as a stagnant wedge within the Earth. So this somewhat unique scenario is what has created present day Mount Peiktu and has really altered how we perceive volcanoes and tectonic subduction. One day, this volcano will erupt again and it will continue to do so until the subducted plate has began to run out of water in the form of hydrous minerals, which will create a scenario that will no longer allow the nearby continental rock to be melted, and it will become non-existent and trapped within a coffin deep within the earth, where it would travel with the Eurasian plate indefinitely or until the next major tectonic event occurs in tens to hundreds of millions of years in the future. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, consider sharing this video around. It really helps the channel out. If you're a fan of volcanism, geology, geography, earth science or science in general, then consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the like button. I'll be releasing more content like this regularly. Leave a comment letting me know what you think about this video. And if you have any video suggestions, please do let me know. Thank you again. I'll see you all real soon.